so good morning. So uh, I'm, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer of this symposium uh, for uh, the for kind invitation to this wonderful occasion, and <coughs> also uh, I think uh, also what uh, I think uh, as a part of this uh, NAO families, I also would like to congratulate on. First, because on Monday I had a chance to visit uh, this, uh, the BISF at Shanghai, uh, the research campus, and for this uh, second phase of BISF innovation campus, which is very, very beautiful. And also at the same time, this 105th anniversary of BISF. So uh, when I was asked to give a talk in this occasion in front of this uh, broad audience, then I, I think uh, I have to somehow think about this uh, because with the theme of this, uh, uh, this uh, sustainable urban living, then I have to think about, the, imagine what the, the future the urban cities would be. And then based on that one, I can just uh, pick two short stories about uh, my own research. So first, the mega trend of this urban, uh, this, uh, Society is typically characterized by these four. So first of, uh, first of them is uh, this society is uh, really hyper-connected through uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, ICT uh, the devices. So it's, uh, there is no uh, this, uh, clear borders between countries because everything is, is uh, connected. And also, I think uh, through, if you look at this one, then th you have all these smartphones and you have online shopping. Yesterday, I, I heard uh, from the, uh, listen to the, t I, I just watched the TV that uh, Alibaba have just, within 20 minutes, they have $5 billion of this uh, for a single stay, right? So you can have online shopping, telecommunications, you have wearable devices, and you have IOTs eventually. So everything is co so connected, and you can collect big data, and also you have to uh, also have deep learning, so everything is just running so fast. And also at the same time, if you look at this uh, quality of life, then you can have this like uh, smartwatches that can monitor your health conditions. And if necessary, then these, you can have patches which is attached to your body. So you can have wearable devices. In some cases, you can have bioimplantable devices. And if you look at the structures, then you can have this bunch of materials. And you have many materials embedded into these uh, simple bandages and they have very unique functions. So if you look at this again, this, uh, look at uh, population then, because yesterday, I think Dr. Bruder Mueller talked about by 2030, the world population will be over 7 billion. But if you look at this uh, population, urban population as opposed to rural population, then as you know, the, the time goes by, you can see that urban population will be a lot higher than this rural the population, which means that everyone is flocking into these mega cities. So this trend is particularly true, particularly in Asia as well as uh, this Africa. Because if you look at this as time goes by, the population increase, particularly in Asia. And also later on, we'll, uh, also we, it's, it's expected that the population in Africa will increase. So based on this one, I think uh, uh, some consulting companies predicted that uh, within every 10 to 15 years, you can double these uh, mega cities because people all want to live in uh, big cities. So I think this is something like uh, Worst law in <laughs> semiconductors, but you can have uh, that's a grand trend. So, if, and also at the same time, you can have this uh, global uh, the climate change, and because we use a lot of this uh, fossil fuels, and you can have generate a lot of carbon dioxide, and you can see that this kind of uh, stopped the polar bear doesn't have enough praise, 
And also you have a burning uh, earth, you sometimes have a desertification. Uh, so the consequences of, of this one is that you don't have enough, like uh, crop production is, is not really predictable. So if you have this uh, food supply chain, so you grow crops in the rural area and you transport everything, but these days, uh, there's a new urban trend is that they want to have like what they call urban farming. So we didn't want this apartment like uh, those buildings, and they want to grow all vegetable within this uh, high-rise building over here. So they, in that case, they need some wavelengths matched LEDs. I will come back to this one with the uh, quantum dots. And I think yesterday we had a good sessions about water qualities and also this water uh, the treatment uh, and also all kind of this uh, membrane technology is very important. And also disinfection uh, through different uh, technologies and different materials would be also very, very important. So, and also yesterday, uh, Dr. Brut Miller talked about this because this population growth and this, uh, this uh, if you look at like uh, visit New York City, then you can have really crowded people over there. So that typically lowers the quality of life and this convenience. So they tend to build high rise buildings. So you can uh, have many big cities, they have skyscrapers. And then this trend is, is keep going up over here. And in order to build really high-rise building, as, as yesterday uh, this uh, mentioned, uh, you, can, you need special uh, construction materials. So instead of randomly oriented fibers, you have well uh, organized, like for example, carbon fiber, glass fiber. You can uh, have totally different materials, and that's how you can build these high-rise materials very effective. So, and also for next generation, I think you need, uh, instead of this uh, internal engine, this automotive, you might have some environmentally friendly next generation batteries. So currently the batteries is lithium ion batteries, but still with this uh, current uh, existing these batteries, you cannot uh, take this, uh, this uh, cars uh, to uh, long distance. So in order to get around it, you can make this uh, battery safer. You probably need all solid state batteries. Well, sometimes you can have different type of material, for example, lithium sulfur batteries, which increase this uh, specific capacity quite a bit. Well, sometimes you can have different materials, different uh, concepts. And also, if you look at these building materials, yesterday, uh, I think uh, this... Uh, Dr. Giano, I yeah, and he talked about uh, this uh, this uh, new glass system and this uh, uh, the uh, illumination system, dynamic glasses. So you can have this uh, thermal insulating and solar control glazing. And this one is really totally new, based on new material, which is again based on chemistry innovations. And you can also see that all these building is uh, energy zero building, means that they just uh, self-sustain with their own energy demand. So they have uh, all this rooftop is uh, installed with the solar panels. And sometimes you can also combine this solar panel with this uh, geothermal energy. Even in Korea, there's one chemical company have this uh, model house. They can combine this solar cell and this uh, geothermal uh, energies. So uh, how can we, based on this mega trend for this uh, urban, the, uh, the uh, mega cities, and how can we uh, fulfill this, uh, this uh, mega trend? So for energy saving uh, uh, devices or some buildings you can have, for example, if we have this uh, lighting system, if you have a very effective lighting system, for example, in this case I just saw uh, our group uh, working a lot on this quantum dot. So based on this quantum dot, we can have a new light source. And also you have this uh, solar cells, whether it's organic solar cells or very efficient hybrid organic uh, the, the solar cell. You can uh, 
uh, reduce this, uh, you can have uh, energy savings as well as uh, using this uh, renewable energy sources, you can uh, maintain uh, this, uh, these buildings very energy efficient. And if you look at this uh, indoor plant farm then, as I mentioned, you have to control these wavelengths. So what I heard uh, from the literature is that by tuning these wavelengths, you can grow certain vegetables such as lettuces, and you can, you can grow this one much, much faster. So if you look at this uh, waste utilization, so this is what we call urban mining. So many people, like a big population in a mega city, they use computers, electronic gadgets, and then when they just throw away, so electronic scraps and also these automotive scraps, you can collect a lot of these precious metals as well as rare earth metals. You have to collect these ones. And also from petrochemical industry, from crude oil desulfurization, you collect a lot of this sulfur. So I'll come back to this one later on, but based on this cheap waste, and we can turn into batteries or IL thermal imaging lenses, then you can have application for cell phones for thermal imaging, or sometimes you can install onto uh, this uh, drone. So this is kind of urban mobility, like uh, many joggers taking dog leashed dogs, but from now on, probably these joggers will be followed by these uh, drones. So that would be setting a new trend. So electric vehicles to protect the environment, definitely this is a new battery uh, technology is needed for next generation electric vehicles. So based on this one, our group, because uh, as uh, Piata uh, that introduced me that as a chemical engineer, we, we basically learn reaction engineering, thermodynamics, and transport phenomena. I think uh, Professor Meyer talked about this block of polymers. But uh, today, I'm just talking about this reaction engine, how we can, based on this scale up, well-known chemistry, how we can make a large quantity so that we can take from the well-defined nanocrystals all the way up to device physics. And second one is uh, this uh, low bottom is about some applications, but among these three I'll just focus on how we can have this uh, like a based on sulfur, some cheap waste we can turn into very valuable high-tech product. So based on this one, so first I will talk about some quantum dot-based LEDs and this hybridization. And second part, I'll talk about using this uh, sulfur waste derived from crude oil and how we can make lithium sulfur batteries as well as this IR lenses based on this. So first, I will uh, get to this quantum dot-based materials for LEDs. So as I mentioned, we need new light sources to save energy. So up to now, the, because this is the invention uh, by Thomas Edison, that we have incandescent lamp. But instead of this illumination, we also waste a lot of energy because by heat, it's very uh, the hot bulb, so energy efficiency is only 5%. But if you replace this one with the LED lamp, then you can increase this uh, energy efficiency quite a bit. At the same time, its uh, lifetime is, is very long. But at the moment, all this technology is there, but still the price is, is too much. So if you, this one is really uh, globally popular, then price will go down and we eventually replace these uh, LED lamps. So as shown over here, even uh, already Europe then, 2012, this uh, old incandescent bulb is not uh, allowed to use it. It will be phased out. Already, I think, are phased out. So, in order to generate these white LEDs, and first, uh, I think, Professor Shuji Nakamura, last year, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the invention of this blue 
uh, light emitting diode. So if you blue light emit diode to generate white beams, and the company in Japan, the Nichia company, is add some this yak sele uh, selenium, this phosphorus, and they, by adding this one, you have these white colors. But the problem is right now is they have a very broad emission band and also this low color rendering index, which is color rendering index, CRI, is how close this light is to the natural light. And this CRI for this binary system, the simple, uh, this YAC C phosphorus is, is very, very long. And how can we have this LED light source is very close to natural light. And as you can see here, this color temperature is very high. And depending on the preference, like people in Europe, they want warm white. I think the people in Asia, we don't care about whether this is chilling white or warm light. And yesterday when we had a banquet, then on the, when I look at my cell phone under the LEDs, it, it has different colors because the CRI and this color temperature is not well matched. So, uh, for example, uh, the, in order to generate these white LEDs, then uh, usually quantum dot, particularly in red, is embedded into on top of this uh, blue, which is a gallium nitride based LED, and and this quantum dot is mixed with this resin, typically epoxy or silicon resins, and then uh, they just add this one, simply using, taking advantage of down conversion, you can generate these white beams. So, why quantum dots? So this quantum dot is semiconductor nanocrystals confine, confining these excitons in three-dimensional, uh, three uh, three spa the spatial dimensions. So uh, due to this, what we call this quantum confinement effect, using the same material by controlling the size, because this is the, thanks to the ingenious inorganic chemists, they can make really well-defined nanocrystals. And based on, for example, cadmium selenide, by simply controlling the size, you can have different emissions. At the same time, when you compare these quantum dot emitters, with these organic counterparts, then you can see that the uh, emission is very, very narrow. And at the same time, this is based on the same molecule by simply changing the size. But if you look at this organic RGBs, then in individual phosphors, you have to do different synthesis. So in that case, if you have, or if everything is perfectly working fine, then you can have a really good high color gamma. You can generate these colors very, very well. And at the same time in our group, because I have, uh, I'm a chemical engineer, we know how to scale up this process. So using uh, like a heat up process, we add all these precursors by controlling this reaction temperature and this time, and we can, with one batch, we can have uh, many multigrams of this quantum dot uh, with different uh, emissions. We can even extend it into different uh, shape. So for quantum dot, like uh, spheres, then we can have application for the, the, elect like, uh, <coughs> the electron converted into photon, which is LEDs. But if you have this rod or this tetra sh the part, then you can have this uh, photon to electron conversion, which is uh, something somewhat related to, to these uh, solar cells. So our group, we can have a really well-defined large quantity quantum dot. We can also have well-defined nano rod with different aspect ratio. And at the tip, we can have different uh, heterogeneous uh, structures so that we can take advantage of this different uh, this, uh, non-covalent interactions such as dipolar interactions. And for example, we can also have this tetrapod, and this is a very useful material for solar cell applications. So uh, my concept is usually inorganic material is very, very good for, 
functions. So this quantum dot for example, if you take one example, we have quantum dot. We typically, when we synthesize it, we have a very short chains like the oleic acid. But if you use this one, but this one has very unique functions, but we, it's, it's not very easy to process it. And due to, because van der Waals interactions, they tend to aggregate. So you need to disperse this one within polymer matrix so that I can just use this poly, like uh, nanoparticles dispersed in polymer matrices. I just treat that as a simple polymer thin films. So in order to do that, I have to have, uh, I have, I start with this uh, functional nanocrystals. I can wear some functional polymers which I can design. For example, we can design these polymer brushes with the specific interactions with the surface. There, I, I can uh, end up having what I call quantum dot organic, inorganic hybrid systems. And once I can make this one, I can have functions as well as processability at the same time. So in order to, one example is that using for polymer brush synthesis, for example, raft polymerization, then you can have whatever whole transporting material. And second uh, sequence, we add this active ester uh, moieties, and then this one is reacting uh, with this primary amines, and you end up having disulfide or sulfide bond, which has the preferential interaction to the surface. So when these polymer brushes interacting with the surface, which I classify them as a hybrid, if before this modification with amine, this perfluorinated, uh, this uh, phenol doesn't have any interaction with the surface, which I classify them as blend. Is there any difference? So if you look at this one, when we have like about 2.5 weight percent loading of this quantum dot, if we have a hybrid system, then all this quantum dot is well dispersed within the polymer matrices. Even if you look at this uh, cross-section, then all this quantum dot is really well dispersed. Once we make a thick sample using drop casting, you can have OM image and fluorescence imaging with this green fluores uh, emitting quantum dot, you can have a uniform colors. But if you have quantum dot blend, simple blend, without any interactions, then you can have some not uniform dispersion. From thickness direction, you can only quantum dot migrate either to the top or bottom. And if you make a thick sample, then you can have a massive aggregation within these polymers. So this kind of this colloid physics to stabilize this functional material within the polymer is very, very important. And once we make this hybridized polymer, we can just treat them as like a polymer. We can make a thin film. We can apply any kind of unconventional imprinting technique or capillary lithography, and we can do this passing, as shown over here. We have OM images and fluorescence OM images with the green emitting quantum dot. You can have a uniform dispersion. You can have a uniform uh, emissions based on this. And this is hybridization is, is more important when we use anisotropic nanocrystals. So this is the tetrapod with different arm lengths over here. So without brush, as I classify them as a blend. And you can see that as we increase the arm length, you can see the massive aggregations. But if we design these brushes which have a preferential interaction with the surface, then you can see that as we increase the arm length of this tetrapod, then you can see that we have a really good dispersion. So this is the how you can control this exciton pathways. So this is kind of colloidal, this, the, the stability this is very, very important. And this is, again, uh, also calculated, like uh, uh, confirmed by this Monte Carlo simulation in collaboration with this uh, University of Mainz in Germany. And using very simple, uh, like entropic-driven, uh, this depletion flocculation theory, even with the simple theory, you can see that 
with this coated hybrid or blend, you can see a huge difference between this uh, center of mass between these two objects. So we can have a really good dispersion between these uh, two uh, systems, two different systems. So based on this one, I think uh, Samsung Electronics recently commercialized this uh, super high definition TV based on this quantum dot. And I think uh, we did the project with the Samsung Electronics. They finally commercialized it, and they just uh, announced it. So using this, uh, the, the technique they use is, is using typically uh, backlight unit application, which is uh, this quantum dot is dispersed into the resin. And they just simply taking advantage of down conversion, they can generate really uh, good uh, white LEDs over here. So the two directions, uh, future directions, is, is that people are a little bit worried that because cadmium-based quantum dot has good functions and good physics, good principle verifications, but for commercial, if this one is massively produced, then they have to worry about, we need to get rid of this cadmium over here. So Samsung is currently almost commercialized this cadmium-free dots. And also, instead of this down conversion type, this passive, uh, this uh, down conversion uh, emissions, people also want to have this uh, electroluminescent type, uh, this, uh, this quantum dot as a emitter in like an OLED-like uh, device structure. So in our group, we also did using typical OLED like uh, structures, we replace emitters with this quantum dot. And if our quantum dot is very stable and the shell phase is thick enough, there is no energy transfer between phosphors. In that case, by mixing this quantum dot different ratio with different uh, quantum dot with different emissions then we are able to generate really wide LEDs over here. So in this case, when we use f four different type of uh, quantum dot with different uh, emission wavelengths, then our CRI is 93, means that it's very close to natural light. So in order to achieve this, you have to start with a well-defined quantum dot, very stable, and then you can just simply mix it and just make a very thin film, and you can generate. So our next generation display technique, I think should, we need to have a color reproduction due to this high color purity, which can be achieved by this uh, quantum dot. If this quantum dot is well-defined, it's stable enough. So this full width half maximum is, should be less than 40 nanometers, which can be achieved with this, uh, this quantum dot over here. And theoretical internal quantum uh, uh, efficiency should approach 100%. And also, this is typical for OLED and this QLED. You have a thin, lightweight, large viewing angle, low operation voltage with a high response, which is all display device, they need this one. And also, at the same time, you need a very low cost uh, processing uh, uh, process should be uh, available. So I think uh, Samsung is uh, about four, four to five years, uh, the four years ago, they uh, showed the first demonstration of this based on this quantum dot. And in this case, you have typical OLED-like structures, which just simply replace this emission layer with this uh, quantum dot uh, simple layer. So. The issues right now is we need to have, for quantum dot emission layer, we need to have a high quantum efficiency for uh, this, for both like uh, RGBs. And we, there's a difference between PL and EL. EL, we inject electron hole from a separate uh, this, uh, electrode. And we have to understand this exciton generation mechanism. And we have to also study this exciton recombination joint studies, where these excitons meet and emit, because we, ha we have to generate these excitons right at the quantum dot, and we have to, in order to have a very efficient 
uh, the quantum dot based LEDs. And we also have a carrier transporting layer. So usually this uh, electron hole injection, this is not well balanced. You need to have a really well balanced injection so that we can maximize the, this emission from this uh, quantum dot layer. And also many devices, we need to have a very long term lifetime and also environmental issues. So we address this one one by one. So we first studied this using quantum dot layer by layer temperature. We studied this exciton drone recombination studies. And we found out that we only need one or two monolayers, not more than many layers. Only one or two is just all we need. And also, in order to have a balanced charge injection, instead of conventional structure, we just switch to inverted structure because this quantum dot has different LUMO HOMO level and we have to take different uh, strategies. And finally, using environmentally benign quantum dot, which is based on indium phosphate, we make quantum dot uh, these LEDs and this one is more or less show a very great uh, promise. And more recently, we just took it even further. So using this kind of core shell structures by controlling, so to begin with, in order to have a genuine UV LEDs, the quantum dot based LEDs, then we start with a very small core size because small core size with, with a wider band gap, but still at that time, it's not easy. So we, what we did is we did atomic diffusion by further increase the reaction. So let this reaction between core shell make this interface diffuse. And by controlling this uh, reaction condition, we are finally able to generate genuine UV emitting quantum dot based light emitting diode. And we again use inverted structures. And this one has very interesting application for regular visible uh, quantum dot you can excite. And also we have a counterfeit detection or well, sometimes if we have a UV, then you can have sterilization using this kind of uh, this, uh, UV, uh, this quantum dot based LEDs. So, so this is first part of my talk is about, you have to start with a well-defined uh, this quantum dot, and then you need to find a way to have well dispersed so that you can increase the processability. And based on this one, you can have a really efficient uh, devices based on the, like for LEDs or solar cells. So my second part is about sulfur utilization. As you can see that from crude oil desulfurization, you have these mountains of this yellow powder. So this yellow powder comes from crude oil through this desulfurization. So you generate this one and then finally they just cyclize eight membered rings. And that's how you can have this one. And depending on the crude oil source, you can have different amount of this sulfur. But uh, some like uh, countries, like for example in Canada, then they just have uh, this yellow, this uh, sulfur uh, pyramid structures they are currently building because they have excess. So annually they have more than six million tons generate worldwide, and you need to find a good use of this excess amount of sulfur. So what's really nice about this sulfur is that it has very interesting properties. First one, it has very high energy densities for lithium insertion. So many people talk about lithium sulfur batteries. But up to now, the performance is, was not very satisfactory. So you need to find different way to modify this sulfur. And another one is good electrical insulator. Sometimes this is good, or sometimes this is not good. You have to modify it. And another uh, interesting property is this is a high refractive index. But the, the problem right now is the sulfur doesn't dissolve into any organic solvent. It's a, it's a really crystalline powders. And also, so that's why you need to, f if you find a good way to process the sulfur, like a polymer processing, then you can take advantage of these, all these good physical properties. So, 
For example, lithium sulfur batteries, when you compare with the conventional lithium ion battery cathode, and typical specific capacity is about less than 200 milliamp hour per gram. But if theoretical uh, specific capacity with elementary sulfur, then you can have 1600 milliamp hour per gram. So there's huge difference. So there is a driving, strong drive to use this one. At the same time, this sulfur is a waste from crude oil. And at this, another one is high refractive index polymers. If you have, because I'm wearing a glass, and if you have a high refractive index glass, it's very expensive, and this is due to you have sulfur content. So if you look at this uh, molecular refraction, then among many other combinations, this by incorporating this sulfur into this system, you can have very high. Uh, so when people do this one, because I'm not the first one who do this, and there has been around, many people worked on this sulfur, very famous people. So when they did this one, if you look at this one, when you start with the yellow powder, and above melting point, you can have a yellow liquid. And then you can, if you heat up, then you can have these uh, polymers over here. But if you cool down, then they just automatically depolymerize, coming back down to rolling back to powders. So I think many famous professors study on this one. But, you know, in terms of application, you somehow make this polymeric structure maintain, and you can just uh, process it. So I think uh, we wrote the, the review paper in this uh, special issue that there are several ways to use this uh, sulfur. So one of them is melt process using diuretical anions, uh, diuretics, and the, the, another one is in aqueous solution, we use dianions over here. And third one is we have a cyclic structure so that we can do just living polymerization. Over here. So first one is what I call melt process. So this is, I think, uh, in collaboration with Jeffrey Pion from uh, University of Arizona when he joined our department as a WSU professor. And we talked about how we can take advantage of this sulfur. So with this molten liquid sulfur, we add a little bit of additives like uh, isoprofenyl benzene over here. It's some, something like a vulcanizer. And then you can have, uh, end up having sulfur polymers. So this one is very, very easy process. So this is something, the idea we had this one, the PMMA is somally not stable material. And then, and then you know, to make this uh, PMMA more thermally stable, you add a little bit of this monomers at the end. And this work as a hairpin so that they can, when they unzip this uh, monomers, then this uh, monomers, the, the second uh, monomers, they can protect this unzipping. So we add this kind of hairpins, like uh, we, we add these additives. And this nice thing about this one is we don't use any solvent. Very, very scalable. We can just have one kilogram even in our lab. And this is mechanically and this chemically very, very stable. So once we make this sulfur-containing polymer, this uh, depending, amount, depending on the amount of these DIBs, and we can have this sulfur finally solve, dissolved in organic solvent. And you can do this a very simple molding. And as you can see, you can pour this one into this mold, and you end up having this Lego-like uh, sulfur-rich polymers. So it's very easy to process. Another nice thing we found out is that when we compare with this PMMA, which is plexiglass for lens, but with our sulfur modified, uh, this uh, sulfur-rich polymers, then you can see that mid-IR region, this is almost transparent. At the same time, depending on the amount of sulfur, we can adjust this refractive index. And up to 2.0, which is huge increase in, in refractive index. So what's the consequence between this PMMA with this uh, sulfur modified uh, this, uh, the, the polymers? And you can see that due to the transparency in mid-IL, then you can see that with uh, IL thermal imaging, you can see that you don't see the image, but with 
our uh, this modified sulfur polyfilms, you can see this uh, thermal imaging over here. So th th this one has very important applications for military applications and as well as thermal imaging for many, many uh, cheap applications, not like a metal coercion. And at the same time, I think uh, Professor uh, Zhang Marilan, he talked about this uh, uh, dynamic covalent uh, chemistry and also self-healable system. And these sulfur polymers, the bond dissociation is much lower than carbon-based polymers. So you can just do, depending on the orient, shear force and then do this uh, thermal uh, annealing, you can make this IR lens healable over here, which is demonstrated over here. We have about like 80% sulfur modified with 28% DIB. And then we can have a visible image as well as mid IR image. You can have a clear image over here. And we just scratched up. So you don't see any image over here, but we just put it back into the mold and you, we, we heat very low temperatures because the sulfur sulfur bond uh, dissociation is low enough, and then we can heal, and you can again see both visible and this mid uh, IL images over here. And for batteries, we, if we use pristine sulfur, then after like a 50, 60 cycle, immediately battery performance goes out, which is not useful for applications. But when we modify the sulfur then, Initial, our initial system is up to 100 cycles, very stable. But we further modi uh, the, the, uh, modify this uh, sulfur cathode, and by preventing sulfur dissolution into the electrolyte, and also with the high C rate, and you can see that there's huge improvement, and we further improve that this specific capacity maintained above 1,100 over 500 cycles. So second one is using uh, this uh, aqueous uh, di-anion systems. So for example, uh, if we have excess amount of sulfur, another way to use it is make this sulfur like a micro or sub-micron particles in large quantity. So what we did is we mixed this sulfur with this uh, uh, sodium sulfide in aqueous solution. And then we add some surfactant and a little bit of this uh, cross-linker over here. And this uh, TCP structure is over here. And this uh, CTAB is a surfactant initially. And we found out that only cationic surfactant works with, with these systems. So we started with this uh, aqueous solution. After we add TCP, we still have yellow homogeneous solution. After we have a reaction for eight hours at uh, three uh, the 30 degrees Celsius, we finally have turbid system, means that you, we might have some particles. So we examined the system, you can see that, you can see the well-defined sulfur nanoparticles. And with this dynamic, uh, this uh, light scattering, you can have well-defined structures. So we able to, how can you control the size and this uh, sulfur content? So Using this sulfur chemistry, we are able to control the rank, average number of sulfur between these two groups. And by controlling this rank, we are able to increase the size. At the same time, as we increase the length, we also increase the sulfur content within one sulfur particles. So the mechanism is, is different from typical the emulsion polymerization. This surfactant, like a CTAP, work also work as a phase transfer catalyst. So initially, they have uh, anion sulfur dianions associated with the positively charged surfactant, and they just transfer into the dispersed phase and do this cross-linking over here. At the same time, you have excess amount of this surfactant. You can have this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, CTAP work as a surfactant too. So in order to separate these rows, we replace one of this uh, CTAP with this, uh, uh, this uh, TBAP, which is only work as a the phase transfer catalyst, and we add non-ionic surfactant, just work the, the, the act as a just simple surfactant. Again, we can make a really well-defined sulfur-rich particles. And 
For this case, as I mentioned, the sulfur is not very soluble, not very miscible with any kind of uh, carbon materials, so the surface is easily stripped. So if you increase the solid content like uh, for industry, then they are easily aggregated. So in order to maintain the charge, then we synthesize this positively charged surfactant with this double bond at the end, and this double bond hopefully have a reaction with the sulfur. We finally found that uh, with the rank 4 of sulfur, then over many hours, we maintain the hydrodynamic radius. At the same time, when we measure the surface potential, then this one maintained the positive uh, charge, meaning that this particle is very, very stable. We are able to increase the solid content. So finally, I don't have enough time, so we, we can also modify this uh, Novonian type structures with this uh, cyclic sulfur, and then using this uh, living polymerization, we are able to have uh, really well-defined sulfur uh, nanoparticles. So as I mentioned, sulfur is not very miscible with any kind of hydrocarbons. So we prepare this, uh, uh, this so this uh, Novona Diane is also dried from petrochemical. Like uh, if you have a C5 or a higher waxy resin using this other reaction, you can convert into Novonan or Novonadien. And reacting with another cheap waste, sulfur, then you are able to uh, prepare this uh, cyclic sulfur. And based on this cyclic sulfur, we do uh, ring opening polymerization. And this usually sulfur is well known for deactivation for catalyst, but we are surprised that when we use third generation, the Grubbs catalyst, this one works like a charm. So you can do sequential uh, living polymerization. So we are finally able to make this uh, block of polymer type. But what's really interesting is that as we increase the number of this uh, second cyclic, uh, the, the novonin with containing cyclic sulfur, this one automatically forms these uh, nanoparticles. So as shown over here, as we increase the number of M over here, then we can see that we can linearly increase this uh, hydrodynamic radius over here. So based on this one, we can, as I mentioned, by increasing the amount of sulfur, we can increase the refractive index. And based on this Professor Ueda's uh, this, uh, well-known work on refractive index, uh, as uh, Abe numbers, then our polymer is just around this boundary over here. So based on this one, I think we are able to, by combining different uh, preparation schemes, we are able to prepare well-defined sulfur-rich particles ranging from 20 nanometers all the way up to several hundred nanometers over here. So I think my time is up, so the second part is about the sulfur. You can have industrial waste and you can convert that into very, very valuable product by just simply adding your uh, knowledge over here. So based on thing, this one, I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, Jeffrey Pern. He's our WCU uh, professor. We started this uh, sulfur project all together. Professor Chang Lee and Song Lee uh, is about the quantum dot uh, devices and the synthesis. Jiu Lim, who is in the audience, is, is uh, helping me with this chemistry. And Terim Choi is uh, uh, the worldwide expert in uh, lump uh, polymerization. With that, and I also acknowledge uh, Dr. Rudolf Gentle from University of Mainz. He's my close friend. And we uh, did this ILTG collaboration for the last nine years. And this one worked out really well. So I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. And then, finally, once again, I'd like to congratulate you on the 105th anniversary of this BISF. And also, I sincerely hope that the uh, BISF will create another uh, new innovative chemistry for another 150 years of sustainable and prosperous future. Thank you very much for your attention.